Good morning and welcome to our webinar, Construction Administration During COVID-19. Thank you all for joining us and please continue sharing your recommendations for programs at communications at architects.org. We'll share this contact information again at the end of the program. I'm Eric White, Executive Director of the BSA. And as we respond to the virus, the situation facing us seems to be ever changing. And I wanna share ways in which we are trying to support you during this difficult time. These include a reminder that we have resources at architects.org, uh, which is collecting local and national resources that aim to help architects in the industry directly. Also these webinars, and for now we're aiming for two a week in addition to our knowledge communities that had been on hiatus. However, they started again, uh, some of them started again this past week and a number are beginning to make plans for the coming weeks ahead. We also have identified potential facility locations in the state in response to COVID-19 that can serve as emergency healthcare uh, areas as well as isolation sites. A reminder that our next webinar is next Wednesday and it will be a town hall meeting on issues of COVID-19. The leaders will include Natasha Espada, our 2020 AIA, BSA AIA president, Ted Talukian, AIA, the BSA Foundation Chair, and me. While we continue work on this programming that is relevant to all of our members, the local industry and the design community beyond Boston, I'd also like to mention that this is an opportunity for sponsors that might be interested in, in supporting these programs. These programs are responsive to our times and they serve the greater good of the AEC industry and can reach hundreds during each session. But for right now, we know you're really here for a session on construction administration. Now, before we begin, just a few rules. Because we have a large number of participants, you will all be on mute. For our Q&A period, we have selected a number of questions that were submitted ahead of time. And thank you for sharing these. Though we will not be able to address all the questions, we encourage you to continue to share and you might uh, have during the webinar using the chat function at the bottom of the screen. If the speakers are able to, they will respond. And otherwise, we will try to use these questions to help inform future programming. And please feel free to share your own tips and strategies on CA as well on this chat function. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the COVID-19 resources page at architects.org. And this session will likely be posted by Monday or Tuesday of next week. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that because this pandemic is rapidly changing and is a dynamic phenomenon, no one really has the experience with, uh, with everything. We're trying to figure this all out together. Our conversation today is not intended to provide solutions or even definitive answers, but is intended to support all of you with the knowledge of sharing so that we can begin to move forward together. And now, I'm very excited to introduce to you our speakers, Sheila Kennedy, FAIA, Principal of Kennedy Violich Architecture and Design and Director of Design and Applied Research, uh, MATC, uh, sorry, M Matt Professor at, of Architecture at MIT. Sorry about that, Sheila, <laughs> Blah, tongue tied. Uh, and Tina Stanislavski, AIA, Principal of HMFH Architects and Co-Chair of the BSA K-12 Education Design Knowledge Community. Thank you, Sheila and Tina. Take it away. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Eric, and thanks uh, to Caitlin Hart and the uh, BSA staff. Um, Tina and I will be um, building um, on this week's recent BSA discussion with attorney Jay Wickersham and Jane Weinsapple. And in just a minute, um, Tina is going to summarize the very fluid situation um, that we find ourselves in. Um, but I just wanted to take a moment to introduce what, we'll, what we will try to discuss uh, together today. Um, as you may all know, um, Governor Baker's order now stands that construction projects in Massachusetts should proceed as part of essential work that needs to be done in the state. And at the same time, um, public health officials and the governor uh, of, of uh, Massachusetts um, have also recommended a shelter in place or a stay at home recommendation. Um, and there is uncertainty on how long 
um, that will be in place. Um, so as construction is now considered an essential ser service, um, architects have a new set of circumstances to address. We um, suddenly find ourselves as essential workers who um, need to fulfill our duties to our clients as we conduct um, construction administration with, with our projects contractors. And at the same time, we need to try to do this in ways that protect ourselves and our staffs and their families and, and the communities that we work in. So absent federal leadership, um, this places a lot of importance on regional conversations like the one that we're going to have this morning on knowledge sharing and on um, trying to decide together what um, best practices, if we can even use that word, might be um, and hopefully eventually we'll have a better uh, statewide uh, guidance. So we're going to be talking about three topics today and then I'll turn it over to Tina. We'll be talking about sharing strategies on construction administration with a focus on um, education, K through 12 and higher education. We'll be sharing strategies on, on how to cope um, with the added stress that there is for architects. Um, and uh, this is not just working online, but how can one maintain a firm social culture and, and, and virtual wellness. And um, we will address uh, or try to address some of your questions and share our um, ongoing strategies. And then we'll wrap up um, speculating a little bit on envisioning a future for the education, for the architecture of education, um, what that future could look like. Um, so with this said, um, I will uh, ask uh, Tina to kind of walk us through um, this, this amazing series of events, of, of, uh, of declarations that have happened and are still happening. Great, thank you, Sheila. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think the first, thing that we should talk about after Governor Baker gave his March 23rd order that made us all essential employees. Um, he then issued some guidance on March 25th that has very uh, specific recommendations for sites and uh, safety on those sites. So I encourage all of you to uh, read that letter that he sent out and I think the BSA has it on their website for you. But basically, it gives some recommendations um, that workers on the construction sites drive separately to the site, don't carpool. When they get to the site, they need to have their temperature taken. So somehow all of our construction CMs have to find somebody that's going to be taking all the subs temperatures. Um, everybody needs to wear uh, gloves on site and eye protection. And then if they're working in areas where there's multiple people, they need to be working six feet apart. If they can't work six feet apart, then they need to be given PPE, personal protection, uh, which is probably a mask in most cases, since they have the eye protection and gloves on. Um, in no areas can they congregate with multiple people, so they can't really have uh, team meetings on site. Um, and they need to have access to hand washing or sanitizing stations. They also ask that the sites be cleaned at least one time a day, but it would be better if they could clean them twice a day. So all of those recommendations make it safer for everybody, including the architects, to be on site. So I found that very helpful. Mm -hmm. Great, um, so let's, um, we'll talk a little bit then about um, uh, the work that we do, I think. Caitlin, can you, um, yeah, perfect. So just to give you a little bit of information, this is Tina. Um, I, I'm a principal at HMFH Architects. We are women-owned business and we have 61 employees and we're located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Next slide. So we have two major projects under construction right now. We're working on the Saugus Middle High School, which is a 270,000 square feet facility um, that was supposed to open after the April vacation. That is still under construction right now. And we also have the Bristol County Agricultural High School down in Dighton, Massachusetts. And that's an entire campus of buildings that we're renovating and um, building a new science center and a new uh, student center. 
So both of these projects um, luckily are still continuing, but they each face different problems right now. Saugus, because it's almost finished, um, is supposed to be in the punch listing phase. So we're trying to navigate, you know, getting our people out there while keeping them safe. And the contractor's trying to navigate getting his subs to come to work because they're seeing people that are afraid to come in or people that have someone ill in their shop and then everybody has to be quarantined. So that's the challenges we face uh, with getting that school open. And the Bristol County Agricultural High School is in the beginning phases of construction. So they are actually still open air. They're putting up steel right now, but they are seeing major disruptions in the supply chain. You know, and this is sort of a ripple effect from other countries shutting down China and Italy. Um, they're having trouble getting sheet metal to the site. They're having trouble getting the heavy timber to the site. So we are assuming that we're gonna see some serious delays um, because of those issues. Um, this is Sheila. Um, I am sort of complimenting um, Tina. Uh, we also work primarily um, in education, in higher education. Um, we're a small business. Um, I have usually 15 to 20 working colleagues uh, working with me. Um, and our, our, um, our business is really made up of about 75% private sector work in higher, higher education and then about 25% um, clean infrastructure and material research, which is in both the public and private sectors. If you go ahead, please. Um, so um, we're gonna start talking about strategies for construction administration. And we'll talk about um, what precautions we're currently putting into place and how we're handling our CA responsibilities. Um, so I, I think we're just going to go back and forth. Um, Tina, would you, would you like to begin or shall I? Sure, I can start. So um, as you saw, we have these two major projects in our office. So um, we feel like we are responsible under our contracts to these owners to at least be out on site once a week. So what we've decided is that um, we will not attend any of the OAC meetings. Personally, we will do all of that online. So anytime we need to have a group of people together, we'll do it remotely. Um, we choose one person to go out to the site per week. So that person will drive in, in their own car. Um, when they visit the site, they'll probably be going at like 2.30 or 3 o'clock so that it's sort of after hours when most of the subs are done with their work for the day. Um, we've asked them to wear gloves while they're out there. Uh, we found that latex gloves actually work with the iPad screens. So if you're doing your field report, taking pictures or your punch list, that's one way to keep your hands clean and still be able to use your tools. Um, and we've asked that they stay six feet apart from anybody that's working and not go into spaces where there's multiple people working. Mm -hmm. Um, we're working on um, two uh, projects uh, for universities. Um, one is quite a large project. Um, the other one is a little bit smaller. The, um, and one is new construction and one is an adaptive reuse project. Um, we uh, changed, KVA changed um, online in a series of gradual steps. Um, we started sort of paying more attention to our own physical office and we got into a routine of hand washing and, and um, uh, disinfecting that, that, we, that we were doing even more than before. And then we gradually um, had people stop taking public transportation as they commuted to KVA and we went to shared Ubers. And finally, we closed our office to the public and we've moved um, to work from home mode. Um, however, we do have some physical meetings from time to time um, when we can't avoid them at KBA. Um, one example would, was that we uh, recently uh, met, uh, we practiced um, social distancing while we met and we pulled samples and fabrics for furniture. Um, one project is in early stages, so like Tina, um, supply chain issues are important, and we're also trying to um, uh, look at um, all of the materials and finalize uh, those materials. So we were able to um, have our client agree that because it was impractical to bring the building committee together physically, 
we would produce a digital uh, materials board and digital fabric selection. And so that's what we did. Um, and in general, we're trying to uh, take as many um, activities off site as we can. And to do this, you know, two things have become important in our workflow, even more important, I should say. One is uh, communication, which is a, a really important point that Jane Winesapple and Jay Wickersham emphasized this week. Um, and it's something that can really make a big difference that we can all do more of. Um, so we've really uh, sat down um, with our contractors um, and we've had uh, meetings with just architects and contractors to review the conditions on site that Tina described and also to uh, figure out how we uh, can also mesh our own um, protocols uh, for, for safety with those of the contractor because the contractor is responsible for everyone who comes on site, including the architect. But for example, we will be bringing our own hard hats, our own um, flashlights, uh, vests, and so forth, uh, tapes, measuring tapes, et cetera. And we'll be using KVA equipment and afterwards we will we will clean and disinfect that equipment so we won't be using the contractors you know hats off the rack and things like that when we go on site um the other thing that's really important is is i think just um taking notes and document um documentation documenting um what we're talking about and what we're agreeing to so documentation is kind of like the um other part of communication um and it's a way of capturing um, what has been agreed upon. So we're trying to triage everything that we can off-site. So we can respond to RFIs, we can review shop drawings, um, all this can be done very effectively off-site. Um, we are currently printing um, a CD set um, and we will be wet sealing that, um, one of us, either my uh, partner, Fana Violich, or I, um, we'll travel to KVA to, to wet seal those. Um, or uh, for our project where um, we're in a municipality where we can digitally stamp, we'll be doing that. Um, so let me, uh, let me pause that there. And um, Tina, would you add anything else? No, I would just emphasize um, the documentation that you're talking about as things change, as your schedule changes, it should all be put into writing so that everyone on site, including your client, know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I think that's yes. a very important point to emphasize. And with one of our contractors, we've been discussing how, uh, how we can have a very good webcam on site. Um, and although it's, it's unusual um, to not walk the site personally and see things, um, there could actually be a benefit because we may be able to zoom and even enhance images and you know see things that actually uh, a human eye might otherwise miss and we're generally trying to sort out what tasks of construction administration can feasibly and reasonably be done off-site and really trying to limit those tasks that that must be done on site and using the best practices the best practices that Tina described per the governor's letter and changing the timing um, for our, our visits. Um, our contractor has suggested that we might come on site after uh, hours and right after uh, the site has been cleaned, for example, which also seems like that would be a good idea. So we can't, we have to put aside the idea that upon a phone call, we could pop over to the site at any time and instead have more scheduled visits and limited visits for on-site uh, on um, observation. Just one last thing we've been finding is very successful. Um, our clerk of the works or the CM have been sending us photos of issues so that we can just uh, respond to the photos remotely. And it's actually been quicker doing that instead of waiting for us to get out to the site. Um, we can answer them you know, in a few minutes. So that's another and we're seeing some very unusual things. Um, for example, um, on one site, um, the uh, fire chief uh, was actually um, on FaceTime um, with the contractor. 
and um, was able to electronically approve um, an issue that he felt that uh, could be could be addressed and approved through that medium. So we're seeing a lot more um, electronic uh, permitting. And for those instances, we're also um, just taking note and documenting how how that took place and you know why it took place. All okay, right. So, uh, yeah, oops. go ahead, Tina. <laughs> um, we wanted to talk a little bit about ways to cope with the added stress of all of this uncertainty. Um, we've been working really hard in our office to try to maintain the office culture. Um, and we've been doing that in various different ways. Um, we have our office manager actually call folks um, and check in with them and see you know, how things are going with their office setup at home, whether they need any help with the IT, um, you know, that they're healthy. So just making sure that our employees still feel connected. Um, we've also been doing some fun things like we have a uh, three o'clock planking in our office. So we've tried to do that remotely also where people you know, can send in you know, photos of them planking. Uh, people are also sending in photos of, you know, their setups at home with their pets, with their babies, um, just ways to make sure that we all still feel like we're in office, even though we're remote from one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I, I love the idea of actually um, using the phone, um, you know, a, a medium that we sometimes forget about, you know, in this exactly. time of many pains um, and, and, and many people on different pains. Um, yes, we, we, at KVA, we, we had a, a really um, robust tradition of kind of social hangout times. The office um, would often have lunch all together. Um, we would have uh, events, um, you know, after hours and so forth. So we're scheduling virtual social hangout time where everything except work, you know, can be discussed. Um, and we're doing work from home features of our of our team leaders and teams um, where they're um, there again they show their workspace and kind of gives a glimpse um, about where they are and then um, one other uh, digital thing and then I'll talk about a physical thing we we have a, a thing called hashtag KVA cooks um, because we do actually have some amazing cooks and a dessert chef um, who happen to be architects at KVA and so what we're kind of cooking um, after hours, what we're cooking up is, is some way that we kind of keep our, our community together, whereas previously we would cook for one another. Um, and then physically, um, we're beginning to collect resources. We, we do have um, a workshop at KBA, um, which is a, a full prototyping workshop. Um, and we're asking ourselves, um, whether and how we, we might be able to use our, our CNC, our, our digital tools, to maybe help in some way to fabricate ventilators um, or engage in, in, in distributed manufacturing. And um, we're, we're um, assessing how we can enable KBA to do that, how that can be safe, because now more than ever, it's, it's really a, a great distress, a de stressor to try in whatever ways we can to help others. Yeah, I really like the idea of the cooking. That sounds really fun. I'm gonna have to talk to people in my office about that. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think we will um, try to cycle to some of the um, questions that have been posted um, with the with the keeping in mind um, Eric's uh, comments at the beginning of the discussion that we um, are all in the same boat. We're all confronted with really rapidly changing information and in no way uh, do, do I feel like I am an expert on, on construction administration and COVID. And so um, in that spirit, please um, understand that we're trying to just open up um, shared lines of communication and knowledge sharing within our community. Um, and it's important to capture all of our questions so that these questions can be bundled and hopefully we can find at least state level guidance um, going forward in the future. All right, do you wanna take the first one, Tina? And then we'll, we'll just do a quick back and forth on these. Um, sure. I think we hit on this one a little bit, but 
um, some of the obstacles that we've encountered as construction has continued because our jobs haven't stopped yet um, is just basically trying to figure out how we can service our clients the way we were before all this happened um, by still trying to get out to the job site or trying to do as much as we can remotely. So I think Sheila and I covered a lot of this question at the beginning of our talk, but again, we've tried to, you know, have the, the supers or the clerk of the work send us photographs of issues so that we can answer them uh, remotely. Um, we've tried to be out on site after hours, so we're working almost like a second shift after the workers have left. Um, and when we're out there, we try to uh, keep our protective gear on gloves and eye protection and that sort of thing and mm -hmm. stay away from spaces that have a lot of the uh, subs still in them. Yes, and I would only add that um, one of the obstacles uh, is, is perhaps a, we haven't encountered this specific obstacle, but one could imagine that it could, that the circumstances of COVID would produce this, which would be a, a drop in either um, construction construction craftsmanship um, or quality um, or even adherence to the design because under under any educational project certainly in higher education one is under um, tremendous pressure to uh, finish a project so that students can can move in and and um, and use the project and that pressure is only increased when there are safety practices that the contractor now has to go through, for example, lining people up six feet apart, taking their temperature at the beginning as in order for them to be admitted into the site and other protocols. Um, so we've started a, a gentle uh, conversation about quality, about adherence to the design and look aheads, which I think may take us to the next question. Yes, so many people asked about this, you know, very, very naturally. Um, and I think um, what we've been doing on one of our construction projects is really being um, aggressive about looking ahead. Um, and we've gotten permission from our client uh, for our contractor to order long lead um, elements, uh, glazing systems, um, elevator, um, these are these are and 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 other and other materials that um, were uh, originally specified that have fairly long lead times. And what we're finding is sort of what everybody's finding in terms of the world's connectedness. That even though a company might be listed in California, their product is engineered in Germany, for example. Um, and so the German office is closed, even if the California office is open or working from home. So there are a lot of coordination issues to try to reconcile the construction schedule and identify these long lead items and make sure that they're put in place or that um, equivalent um, substitutions can be made. Yeah, I agree. And again, I think this goes back to the documentation issue that all of these things, as they come up, we can't get sheet metal, we can't get the heavy timber framing, all of those should be, you know, detailed in a letter to your client so that they're not in the dark on these things and they're not surprised when they don't show up on time. Uh, all of that needs to be documented. Mm -hmm. um, submittal samples. Um, We've, we've, we were fortunate in that we have gotten some early submittal samples that we were able to look at physically um, at, in our physical offices, um, but our mail is being held at KVA and it's being do, redirected to another location um, where we feel that we can look at um, submittal samples safely. Yeah, we don't have anything to add to that because we are having the same issue. So, you know, our office building is open on uh, the day of the week that the mail gets delivered. So, um, you know, the submittal samples are going there. We've also had some of them come to our homes uh, so that we can review them and, you know, in person. 
Um, and then we basically just have to make sure that we clean them well before we, you know, handle them. Mm -hmm. Which is sort of the same as we would do with anything we would bring into our home, be that a can of beans or um, anything. So some of this is really just the new normal, um, which is not very normal, of, of just considering that every threshold is a transition where, where cleaning needs to happen. Okay, so um, how can CA teams best use downtime to get ahead of projects? Um, well, it's actually been um, very useful. I'll just, Tina, if I may, I'll just jump in on this yeah, one. Fine. Yep. Um, it's been very useful for us, um, and I would just highlight two things quickly. One is we've taken the time and, and had a bit more time to, um, to, to, to really sit down virtually um, with our contractor team, understand what their concerns are, um, understand what might cause delays for them and what the best workflow is. And we've been able to move certain tasks forward as a result um, of that. And we're able to kind of put our team working on that. Um, nobody goes to the site physically who does not feel comfortable going. That's a, that's a rule in our office. And so um, it would, def you know, it, it, so that that's, we've made everyone comfortable with that. Um, we don't have a large CA team um, and um, we are, at, fortunately, both my partner, Frano Violich, and I are involved in all of our projects. Um, and so we can always go in um, if needs be as well. I think that's a very good point that people, you should be able to talk to your employees and make sure that they do feel comfortable going to the site. And if they don't, then you, know, you don't have to send them. That, that seems like a very good plan. Some of the other things we've been doing um, with the slowdown or the downtime is getting ahead of submittals. So even though, um, you know, material can't be installed at that point, at least you could review the submittals. Um, you could also be working with the contractor on coordination. Mm -hmm. it's something that seems to get rushed, you know, for MEP and, and FP. Um, the other thing that we like to do is to do all of our color selections. So if you can get your submittals and you do know what products you're going to get, that's important in public construction because we are never quite sure until we see the submittal. Um, but you could get all of your col color selections done and put your color boards together. Yes, um, to add only, uh, I already spoke about our recent face-to-face -face meeting when we were face-to-face -face six feet apart. And um, I can't describe how actually pleasurable that was to see some colleagues you know, in person in a safe way. So though, KVA is working from home and our office is definitely closed to the public. Um, there are instances where we do um, meet. Um, and so um, this can also be something that can, that can help um, a firm or a team get ahead on a project to look ahead, as Tina says, about color, fabrics, choices, if the, if the products are known. Um, I think we've been talking a little bit about this. Um, do you have any further thoughts, Tina, on this? Um, I mean, I, I don't, but I think there's some things that seem to be going really well that I would take into my next project, even when this is all through. You know, the fact that um, the uh, supers and the clerk have been sending us photos about uh, questions and issues. Um, and we're able to like help them with those situations quickly versus waiting for us to come out to actually walk the site with them. So I think that's something that I've learned is a really good way to keep things moving on site without having to be there. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think um, just sort of amplifying that, I think, and we'll, we'll be talking about this, um, making best guesses about the future on this, but it's really um, interesting how much um, on-site work can be off-site and whenever possible we're trying to reduce the amount of work that's assembled on-site on these projects. 
So going for more prefabricated uh, solutions that can be um, assemblies that can be um, that can be built off site and brought to site, so less site labor. And also in one case, um, because we do have a workshop, um, KVA is is actually bidding on a componentry um, that we can make in our own shop, which is a clean uh, shop that's closed to the public. So in in some ways we can offload. Um, and reduce the amount of congestion and work that is happening on site by these sort of new approaches to distributed fabrication um, and manufacturing. Right, so when we were, when we were talking um, and planning this conversation, um, we started to think that um, it would be it would be important um, to to kind of conclude with just some guesses and speculations that um, we haven't been hearing so much um, about um, uh, with regard to um, the AIA and architects. In that it's always been assumed that the economy will start right up again um, after the stimulus and after. Um, after the lockdowns or after the vaccine or at whatever point um, you know you want to take as a as a milestone um, but but really um, the, the future has already changed and um, these are very large transformative forces that are at work um, architecture's work practices you know have changed and will have changed and formats for education will definitely have changed as a result of this and, and obviously the world has changed so um you know hopefully there will be a silver lining with a better idea of kind of what it means to you know for planetary health which was a very kind of arcane um area of study before maybe that becomes more important hopefully more transnational cooperation um, on one hand, transnational kind of global co cooperation. And I would guess um, more regional ar architecture on, on the other hand. Um, um, I have a few more thoughts, but Tina, do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I've found it really interesting that um, my office has been able to run so well when we're all apart. Um, I definitely am sick of my screen and miss the people. But I wonder in the future if we won't be more flexible about our work from home policy. Um, I know in our area in Cambridge, the rent is just so high right now that you have to wonder whether um, folks will start working from home and sort of alternating days in order to reduce their footprint. Um, yeah. So have a smaller office. Um, and people don't have to commute as much because that's much better for the environment. So I think all of these things are really interesting topics that we're going to have to really understand after this is over. Mm -hmm. um, I, I agree. And I think that we might imagine the architect's office as some kind of much more fluid entity that would um, you know tip back and forth between online work mode and in our case um, physical material exploration mode making mode um, so maybe there'd be more intense uh, periods of both that would happen and this may in fact need to be the case for all of us because we've learned recently that COVID isn't, you know, one and done. Um, there are going to be hot spots and there may be times when we need to go back to social distancing and then back out into the physical world again until this particular virus is resolved. And we know in the biosphere that there are, you know, well over 3,000 um, un relatively unknown viruses um, and, um, and growing. So I, I, I sometimes wonder if for architects, this isn't the first kind of like globally synchronous perception aha moment of the impacts of climate change, because really the, the rapid growth of cities and deforestation is one of the um, factors that is driving um, and forcing um, novel human and animal contacts. Um, so I think that there will probably be reactive and proactive steps that architects will take. 
Um, so it's not only reactive, like it's not just about specifying infection resistant surfaces in educational buildings, but I think there's gonna need to be some qualitative and cultural changes as well. And I'm wondering if there isn't um, actually a new value um, that um, we place on collective physical spaces of collaboration in architecture and, and the importance of these spaces you know, for educational facilities and buildings. And at the same time, there would need to be enhanced infrastructure and a kind, you know, a new kind of design for schools and universities that would allow this kind of fluid movement between intense physical laboratories, making, um, teaching, hands-on teaching, and online formats, so like a, a real back and forth. Um, and I also think, and I think this is positive, um, different, but positive, that there could be a demand for physical architecture to produce and, and to provide what can't be accommodated and what's missing from our online experience of, of work or education, you know, all of those things, like some degree of spontaneity, a greater degree of, of sensuality and, and, and tactility. And last point here <laughs> online architecture is is you know has been and is primarily visual it's really optical we're seeing images and maybe in the future our physical education buildings or all of our buildings will become much more differently sensorial much more material in the kind of spaces and experiences they offer um and i think for sure how we deliver buildings will change actually how they're built and there'll be much less centralized global manufacturing chains and um, traditional factories and much more, I believe, local material sourcing and regional and distributed production. But these are, uh, Tina and I are just sharing our best guesses um, on what this could be. Um, and so I'm really looking forward. I've been seeing a lot of the um, chats kind of uh, questions float by and I'm really looking forward to reading those um, and um, to having the BSA collect um, these questions, um, bundle them and um, hopefully send them to our state leadership. And I'd just like to say that I think when we were reading through all of the different questions that there were a lot of questions around legal um, issues, you know, with your contract and, you know, the AIA contract for architects with owners. And I, I would encourage the VSA to maybe have another uh, seminar with um, an attorney leading it, somebody who's uh, really knowledgeable about those contracts so that we can understand how we might change that contract in the future, given all of this um, that has happened to us. So I'll, I'll turn that over to Eric and see if maybe they're planning something like that uh, for the future webinars. Mm -hmm. Well, Tina and Sheila, I wanna say thank you very much. And, and I also wanna thank everyone for joining us. I think your, your comments at the end really demonstrate the importance of um, the work that all of you are doing uh, and that this is a changing world. Um, and as uh, Tina and Sheila both mentioned, uh, you know, I think we are continuing to uh, pull together these webinars and would, I would think uh, having another session with an attorney being able to talk about this will be important. And I also would like to remind folks that uh, if you haven't listened to the, the session that was on uh, Tuesday with attorney Jay Wickersham, um, some of the questions that, that you've asked uh, are brought up there as well. Um, but you can continue to share with us uh, through communications at architects.org, uh, through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, your thoughts and ideas and questions uh, as they come up. Uh, our, the president, BSA president, Ms. Natasha Espada, um, has formed a task force that is working on identifying some of the best practices during this time of COVID. Uh, so please share the, your questions and we are putting together, pulling together uh, some of those ideas into uh, additional resources that we'll be putting out there for you. 
We do also hope that you'll join us next Wednesday at two o'clock, uh, which is going to be a virtual town hall meeting and uh, asking folks to continue to share uh, your thoughts. We're gonna talk a little bit about what is it that, that the BSA is doing, but we really wanna hear from all of you folks about what is it that you need? What are your ideas? What are your challenges? And, and how can we help address those? This will be followed by uh, additional sessions. And as I said in the beginning, we're looking to do at least two of these webinars a week. And uh, we are also bringing back, uh, slowly but surely, the uh, knowledge communities are, are coming back together. And, and I know we had one uh, just two nights ago that had a really great turnout. Uh, and so thank you to all of you to continue to work on that. Before we go, I wanna take a moment to thank all of my colleagues on staff. Um, like you, we are working to provide all the resources and delivery methods that we can to share with you and keep you up to date. And finally, please join me in thanking our speakers, Sheila Kennedy, FAIA, and Tina Stanislavski, AIA. We know that your lives have been turned upside down and truly appreciate your willingness to take the time to share with us your knowledge. Thank you for what you do and for doing it so well. And I have to say, I personally really loved both the cooking and the planking sharing ideas for engaging staff. I know, uh, Sheila, I'd be happy to do some taste tests for KVA um, <laughs> after we get through this. And uh, um, while I, I certainly uh, appreciate the planking photos, I, I think that's a good reminder for all of us to keep up our health. And so with that, please be safe, be helpful, and be kind. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Mary. you. Thank you, Tina.